As a child, I was forced to deal with problems that were too complicated for my little mind to understand. I had a father who was strung out on drugs and extremely abusive to my mother. At the ages of four and five, I used to literally watch my father beat my mother up like she was a man. There were days that I remember she had to go to work with sunglasses on because she had a black eye. This one day, he locked her into the bathroom and he threatened to burn her hair with a cigarette lighter if she moved. And when she would even budge, he would take his cigarette, he put cigarette burns on our legs. One of the worst parts for me was when he'd do it outside in front of all my friends. I was too young to even know what it meant to be embarrassed, but I knew the feeling. I, I just knew what that felt like as a kid. At the end of the day, my father was just a problem. He was a problem to me. He was a problem to my mother. My mother had no idea of how to solve that problem. She just became angrier and even more bitter. My parents ended up separating when I was six years old. And even though my father was gone, it was like the problem was still there. The only thing that changed for my mother was the physical abuse. So just a side note, removing the person doesn't always make the problem go away. My mother, she just, she couldn't solve the problem, right? Father was gone. I was growing up. Now, how in the world, as a kid, am I supposed to start learning to solve my own problems? The good news for me was that my grandmother, she stepped in and she became like a wonderful second parent to me. Unfortunately, on St. Patrick's Day in 1982, when I was nine years old, we found my grandmother lying in the bed murdered with a knife in her chest. Someone had robbed her for $140. And from there, my problems just got worse. I mean, by the time I was 14, it was the first time that I was almost killed. When I was 15, a guy put a loaded gun in my head, pulled the trigger several times, no bullet came out. Not pointing the gun at me, literally pulls the trigger one time and poof, bullet comes right out. By the time I was 20, my life was just so problematic and so volatile that I seriously thought that I would be dead before the age of 21, unless I figured out a better way to solve my problems. And see, that's the problem with problems, right? We think that there's something that needs to be solved. We treat them like they're afflictions or diseases that need to be cured. A problem, that's not what it is. A problem is more of a relationship that needs to be managed. A problem is the gap between what we want and what we have. And there's a tension in that gap. And the tension that exists between what we want and what we have, that's what we usually call a problem. I learned that my problems weren't just necessarily there to be a miserable thing or a burden in my life. I started learning that problems, they had a way of helping me out. Problems weren't there just to make me miserable. They were there to help me out. There were these five things that I came up with. It was almost like a summary of the way problems had affected my life. But if you don't remember anything else, remember these five things, right? Number one, problems direct you. They inspect you. They correct you. They also have a way of protecting you. And fifth and finally, they perfect you. I'll run through that one more time. They direct you, inspect you, correct you, protect you, and they perfect you. And sometimes they might do 
all of those things at the same time or some combination of those things at the same time. You think about the biggest businesses in the world. They're only so big because they solve a big problem. Think about some of your greatest achievements. Aren't they so great because they were so hard to achieve? You know, um, in college, I was faced with this decision. I could either forego my senior year and go into the NFL, or I could come back and play my senior year the next year. I was kind of torn about it, so I said, who's better? Who, who else could I talk to that would be better than my, my coach, right? So I go to my coach's office. We sit down in his office, and I just start talking to him. I say, coach, you know, I'm struggling with this whole NFL thing. And immediately, I mean, like, he goes off on me. I'm talking about he goes off. You've been talking to agents. There's no way in the world that you're going to ever make it in the NFL. That would be the dumbest decision that you can ever make. I mean, he just starts screaming at me. And remember, like, I'm this little young rough cut. You know, you can't just, <laughs> you know, you can't just talk to me any way. I wasn't as refined as I am now. <laughs> and, you know, he, he also told me, he said, I'm going to my press conference. And I'm going to let them know just the bonehead decision you're even thinking about. And he said, if any of these scouts come here for you, don't think that I'm going to tell them something positive about you. And I'll be honest with you, I was just kind of blown away because I was just like, Coach, you know, I was just coming here because I thought you could give me some good advice. You know, I've been thinking about it. I've been praying about it. God, don't answer no stupid prayers like that. I just looked at him. And I got up. I said, Coach, you know what? Thank you. Because even though it didn't come in the package that I wanted it to, he gave me all the advice that I needed. I turned around and I, you know, started walking out the door. And before I walked out the door, it's like the pride in me just couldn't just walk out in peace, you know. <laughs> I turned around and I said, you know what, coach? I said, I respect my elders. So I'm not going to say to you what I really want to say to you. I said, but you know what? The one thing I'm 100% sure of is that I will not be coming back here to play for you next year. For me, I'm either going to the NFL or I'm going home. Bye. And I walked out the door. And he kept his word. He told the NFL scouts everything that they, he could possibly tell them negative about me. You know, the chances of me making it to the NFL were so slim. There was this one coach. His name's Bill Parcells. Some of you may know him. <laughs> He decided that he was going to be the only one who took a chance on me. He drafted me in the third round. Now, let me just give you a little backstory. During my college career, I was hurt every year. I, I mean, missed more than 60% of the games in college. And so my chances of even surviving in the NFL were very really slim. But Coach Parcells took a chance on me, and I was so determined. Because this was the first time, literally, he was the first positive male role model that I ever had in my life. So I was determined not to let him down. I worked like I'd never worked before. I did everything in my power so that I could be the best player I could be. And you know what? I ended up winning the Rookie of the Year. And for those of you who don't know, that means like I was the best player in the NFL for their first year, right? I ended up winning the rushing title, which means I was the best player in the NFL at my position at what I did, right? And I ended up going to the Pro Bowl, which it's almost like winning the Nobel Peace Prize in the NFL, right? <laughs> and I remember a couple years later, I go back to my college. I see my coach. I walk up to him. Hey, coach. And I know, like, he's kind of, you know, like, <laughs> egg on his face, right? And I said, Coach, you know, I just wanted to come and thank you. I said, uh, and I sincerely mean it. And I really meant it that time because when I think about where I would have been had he not put that problem in front of me, had he not challenged me that way, disrespected me that way, I would have more than likely came back to college. And who knows what would have happened. I was injured every year up to there. I'd have probably been injured. I probably wouldn't be standing here today. So when I look back on it, his attitude, his approach to me, it directed me because it totally pushed me into the NFL. There was no way in the world I was going back to college. It inspected me 
because I had to really dig deep. I had to look within myself, and that champion in me had to rise to the occasion. It was either that or go back home. It corrected me because, to be honest with you, a lot of the stuff that he was telling those NFL scouts was true. I didn't even take football serious. I didn't even want to play football. Football was like the last thing that I wanted to do. But I saw it as an opportunity to use it to do the things that I really wanted to do, which was to impact people's lives in a positive way. It protected me because, like I said, what if I had gone back to college? I definitely wouldn't have been a rookie of the year on all those awards, all those accolades. That wouldn't have happened. And ultimately, it perfected me because to be honest with you, coming from where I come from, I never even thought there was a chance for me to be the man that I am today. I've learned to view life through the lens of those five things. So I'm always thinking, is this directing me, inspecting me, correcting me, protecting me, perfecting me? I'm always thinking about that whenever I face any problem. And it's changed the approach that I go into my problems with. Because see, most of the time, because our view is that our problem is such a miserable thing, is such a burden and all that, we usually try to run away from our problems or avoid our problems or we sweep them under the rug. What if you're running away from your greatest opportunity? What if you're sweeping some of the things that you've been praying for under the rug? Because many times, a lot of the things that you're hoping for are right beneath the surface of your problems. See, problems aren't all that bad. You know, just to bring the story full circle, my mother, right, she had a bad relationship with that problem that was my dad. One day, we're riding through my old neighborhood, and we stop at this red light, and I look over, and who do I see? My father, right? He's standing at the bus stop. And I said, oh, mom, mom, look, there go my dad over there. She said, so? I said, why don't we just give him a ride? I bet you he's going home. And literally, my mother was almost like my coach. She cursed me out even worse than him. <laughs> she said, there ain't no effing way he's getting in my mother effing car. I don't know what the F you're thinking of. I mean, like, she literally went off. My mother never really cussed me out like that, right? And I just said, Mom, you know what? I got to be honest with you. Right now, you are the angriest, most bitter woman probably in the world, definitely in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I said, this man has been ruining your life since I was five years old. I'm 28, and you still feel the exact same way. Mom, look at him. He, he's not thinking about what you're thinking about. It's like things couldn't be better for him. He don't care that you're like this. I said, you're just ruining your life. And to be honest with you, you never showed me the love and affection growing up. Like, I, I think you were so bitter because of him that you couldn't even show love to me. And you know, my mother, she just got quiet. Light turned green. She starts to pull off. And then she pulls over. She rolls down the window. She tells my, asks my father if he needs a ride. He gets in. I get in the back seat because I just wanted to really make it what it was. So <laughs> he, he sat in the front seat. And we ride home. They had a great conversation. This is their first conversation in 20-some years. He gives my mother a hug. He gets out the car. He walks up, goes in his house. As soon as he shuts the door, my mother turns around and just starts bawling. I'm talking about just bawling. It, it makes me emotional because I never saw my mother cry like that. So I gave her a hug. After I finished hugging her, I started wiping the tears from her eyes. She said, Kurt, I feel like I just dropped off a whole big bag of bricks. So at the end of the day, I think we have to be careful the way we view our problems because Hitting behind some of our biggest problems are also some of our biggest blessings and some of our greatest opportunities. And if you think about it, look, problems aren't going nowhere. We're going to all deal with problems until the last day we are on this earth. They'll be here until we die. So I think it's in our benefit 
and in our best interest to have a better relationship with them. Thank you. Thank you.